tonight. It's time to tell the Palestinians, abandon your fantasy of destroying this world. Okay, so maybe this is the moment. My, my hands are sweating. This shows how bullshit, and excuse my French, this whole thing is. North Korea reportedly put talks with South Korea on pause and threatened the upcoming summit with President Trump over U.S. and South Korean joint military exercises. The peace process was never going to be easy. The administration says it's assessing the situation. You know, look, this news just came out. I can't verify it just yet. Um, it's very early on in the process, but we're planning ahead for our meetings. Uber will now allow employees and customers to take civil cases of sexual assault and harassment to court instead of forcing closed-door arbitration. But the policy change only applies to individual cases, so victims can't pursue class action lawsuits. Lyft dumped its forced arbitration policy as well. 94% of America's public school teachers buy supplies for their students without getting paid back, according to new federal data. They shell out $479 a year on average, but teachers at low-income schools spend even more, an average of $554. As part of its bankruptcy, Toys R Us is selling off hundreds of domain names, including sextoysrus.com. Russian President Vladimir Putin opened the longest bridge in Europe, physically linking Russia to the Crimean Peninsula it took from Ukraine back in 2014. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing battles on many fronts. In the Golan Heights, he's dealing with new threats from Iranian forces in Syria. He's also facing international condemnation from the killing of Palestinians at the Gaza border. We travel to Jerusalem to ask him how his administration is responding. That's the Iranian drone we shot down. It's got a wing here, fixed wing here. So this was an Iranian drone sent over Golan Heights, right. you shot it down. They then sent missiles and artillery to attack right. you on Golan Heights, and then you, right. so this was the start of everything. Right that was here. it, that was this it, was and beginning. you see it. The center was blown up by our interception, but these are the parts that come from the center. And I think it's the first time that we're showing this. Yeah, it's the first time. Uh, yeah. How do you know it was 100% Iranian? Uh, we know for sure because this is an Iranian drone. You can see pictures of this drone, by the way, in Iran itself. We also have, obviously, the intelligence right. uh, that uh, we, we were aware that they were doing this. They had explosives in this drone, too. You have intelligence that the Revolutionary Guards are moving in other weapons. Right. What happens? Does this escalate? I hope not, because I hope they'll get the message that we're not going to let them do it. The day before our meeting, the U.S. officially moved its embassy from Tel Aviv Jerusalem. to Jerusalem, Israel. setting off a massive protest in the Gaza Strip that ended with at least 60 Palestinians dead. Today was a historic day. The yeah embassy opened here in Jerusalem, yeah. and but yet at the same time there were unprecedented riots in Gaza. Not riots. Or D deliberate infiltration attempts uh, paid and organized by Hamas. For 20 years they didn't open the embassy because they were afraid of violence. And now the embassy was opened and there was violence. So what do you say to the criticism that's coming from around the world? I think, I think that uh, President Trump did a very important thing. He not only kept his promise and, and the promises of successive American presidents, he also recognized a simple reality. You're sitting now in, my, uh, in the government office of the Israeli government in Jerusalem. The prime minister's office is right here in Jerusalem. The Israeli government, the seat of Israel's government, is in Jerusalem, which is its capital. And it's been the capital of the Jewish people only for 3,000 years. And I think that's the key, ultimately, to peace. Because a peace that's based on lies will crash on the rocks of Middle East reality. Mm. And it's time to, to tell the Palestinians, abandon your fantasy of destroying Israel. Abandon the fantasy that you will conquer Jerusalem. Abandon the fantasy that says Israel will disappear. It will not. But didn't they not do it for 20 years because they didn't want it to preempt a peace process, so i.e. in a negotiation where, because Palestine believes that it's a capital too, so it's a dual capital or what have you, so they didn't want to say, well, in case this is a, a negotiating block, we're taking it off the table. Well, I think what he took off the table is the fact that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. He didn't define exactly 
you know, how, where the line would be in Jerusalem, but he said it's very clear that this part uh, where, where we're sitting now uh, is whatever, is going to remain Israel's capital. He's right. The Prime Minister's spokesman was just as adamant that actually it's the Israelis whose lives are in danger. A genocidal terrorist organization that long before any embassy Hamas. was spoken about, Hamas, was calling to kill every single Jew. We can't afford to just say, well, that's hyperbole. Maybe they don't mean it. The head of Hamas, Yehia Sinwar, said, uh, We will tear down the border and we will tear out their hearts. I take him at his word. I think he's trying to tear down the border because he's trying to destroy Israel. But tanks against rocks is not a fair fight. Well, long before any tank was used, we used rod dispersal methods. I'll tell you what makes it so hard to not hit anybody who isn't involved. It's the fact that they're shooting from behind kids. That's why they're burning tires to put up a smoke screen to make it harder to see who's a civilian and who's an armed combatant. But Hamas has no concern whatsoever for their people. We could be wonderful allies with Palestinians living in Gaza. Why not? The people are not the problem. The regime is the problem. from yesterday's violence in Gaza rose overnight. But hundreds flocked to the border again on Tuesday. And today, the Israelis seem to be relying more on gas than bullets. That one's from the drone? Yeah. Okay. That's an Israeli military drone that's dropping tear gas on the protesters. I think it's got another load now. It's hovering right overhead. It's coming down now. You can see it landing over there. Hamas says the protests will continue. The group's leader, Ismail Hania, even showed up here in person to deliver that message. Tuesday is the anniversary of Nakba, the Arabic reference to the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948. In the West Bank city of Bethlehem, demonstrators burned tires and threw stones. And Israeli police responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. But these annual protests have been overshadowed by events in Gaza. Today, the Palestinian Authority blamed Israel and the US for the 62 deaths on Monday. Sa'ab Erekat is the chief negotiator for the Palestinian Authority. Those who are responsible for the killing of the 60 Palestinians are, number one, Israel, Israeli Prime Minister, Israeli Army, and secondly, President Trump personally, by his decision, hasty decision, illegal decision, to move the embassy to Jerusalem, this region needs peace. This region needs moderate. This region, we need, we need to save lives of Israelis and Palestinians. And we don't do this by taking such decisions. We do this by negotiating a fair and a just settlement between Palestinians and Israelis based on a two-state solution. Back in Gaza, doctors braced for the next round of casualties. Two more were killed today, and first responders here say they're already overwhelmed. I think I will never see anything like this in my life. It was even worse than the war, because the number of these injuries in a short time, it will never happen even during the war. About four to six hours, we had like 2,700 injuries in all over Gaza Strip hospitals. Some people say the gas is like a, a, a different type. Different kind of gas, like we've witnessed with many patients. Uh, these gas inhalations uh, injuries caused some people to have uh, seizures. This is the funeral for Leila Al Gandor, who was just eight months old. Gaza health officials say she died after being exposed to gas near the border yesterday. And scenes like this one are only going to drive more outrage. 
and probably more violent. An estimated 15 million people are competing this year in one of the most valuable lotteries in the world, the contest to get an American green card. The Diversity Immigrant Visa Program, established in 1990, hands out 50,000 green cards every year to people from underrepresented nations, with the goal of diversifying the population of U.S. immigrants. That means people from countries like China, India, and Mexico can't apply. But aside from that, there are almost no requirements. It costs nothing to apply, and you only have to submit some limited biographical info. No other country in the world has a visa lottery like this. The only downside is that it's almost impossible to win. In 2017, only around one quarter of 1% of applicants ended up with a green card. Vice News followed three people who rolled the dice this year. I came to the U.S. in August 2013 to start grad school at Columbia, and it's my fifth year both in grad school and in the U.S. When I was doing my undergrad in Moscow for five years, I lived with my grandma. So after five years of living with my grandma, it was fine to move, <laughs> even so far away, uh, although I now miss my family and friends very much. If I do win the green card lottery, it will be easier for me to find a job because I will not be restricted to only those employers who can sponsor H-1B work visa. But also, I really like the political atmosphere here. And I, I was never political before I came to grad school, but here I got involved with the union and sort of started organizing and became more aware of uh, my own views on different issues. The first time I came to the US, um, I was a young adult and it was uh, for a performance. I only stayed four days and I was shocked in the good way. Four days was too short for sure, uh, but I really enjoyed it a lot and uh, it came to my mind to go back to New York as soon as possible. I want to stay in America because first of all, jazz was born in America and there is definitely a culture and a tradition here. that uh, is different in French. To meet jazz is really to meet it here and here in New York. My American dream is uh, not necessarily to make tons of money or to be successful, but to have the freedom to do exactly what I want to do, uh, artistically speaking. Because? One for nature. For nature. Exactly. I'm from Ghana. I'm, I'm a student in Bronx Community College, and I'm studying uh, computer information systems mainly on uh, programming. I left Ghana because it wasn't safe for me. So I traveled to Brazil. Right from Brazil, I traveled uh, across countries in the southern part of uh, America, right into the United States. So my immigration status right now is an asylum seeker. Looking at the duration that I have to wait till 2020 before I appear before an immigration court, I thought it wise to you know go to college to show them that you know whilst I was waiting, I was also, you know, going to school. People say it's a land of freedom. But then again, the quality of education in the United States is second to none. So I believe that coming here, you know, would give me that opportunity, that sense of, you know, having been able to achieve something in life. And so that's the reason why I chose the United States. I'm just hoping and praying that, you know, my chances that it comes, that I win, and, you know, I take it from there. I'm not particularly nervous because I'm not very hopeful. Uh, I do hope I'm wrong, so we'll see. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I'll copy my confirmation number. Has not been selected. That's pretty much it. Okay, so maybe this is a moment. Okay, my my hands are sweating. Mm, and it's not good. It's uh, it's just that uh, it would have helped a lot and um, would have made this uh, this uh, journey easier. The show will uh, will go on for sure. I want to stay in the United States to be able to have a better future. 
It's a blessing to have this DV Larry being called today and the Ramadan starts today too. So I'm just hoping that, you know, it happens that I win. Who knows? Let's hope and see. I'm shaking now. And it's taking time to load. Well, actually, the website is down. I think uh, there's too much people. Uh, check in. Keep refreshing the page. Keep refreshing the page. So I've not been selected for the visa lottery. Yeah. So what is, what's next for me is just to concentrate on my college. You know, I'll take my chances and reapply. And, you know, keep wishing and hoping for better, better things ahead. In a congressional hearing last week, Department of Energy Secretary Rick Perry suggested the federal government might use a Cold War era law to prop up the coal industry. It's about the national security of our country, uh, of, of keeping our uh, plants, all of them, online. The proposal is only a vague idea, but Perry seems to be indicating that the government step in to keep failing coal power plants running by using public money. The Defense Production Act is a law passed at the onset of the Korean War that gave the federal government broad authority to prop up businesses and industries deemed necessary for national defense. Originally, that meant compelling industries to meet wartime production targets. Some heavy industry was even nationalized, with the government taking over steel mills to guarantee output. But since Truman, presidents have used it more creatively. President Obama, for instance, used it in 2011 to get telecommunications companies to divulge information about Chinese spyware in their systems. Now, the Trump administration thinks the DPA could be used to revive coal. So does that mean the decline of the coal industry is a national security threat? Energy security is the ability to provide energy for your economy and for your ability to fight and win a war without having to depend on a hostile country. You know, right now we don't need coal for that because we have natural gas, we have nuclear, we have abundant renewable supplies. That means that legally, the Trump administration might have a hard time justifying this use of the DPA. There's nothing in the law about bailing out uh, on economic power plants. Um, Rick Perry would have to conclude that there's a national defense purpose in providing certain electric generators with preferred rates. I think the rest of the ener energy industry would, would bring the administration to court. But the Defense Production Act isn't Trump's first long shot attempt at using an old law to save the coal industry. Last year, the administration referenced an even older and more obscure law called the Federal Power Act that could have, hypothetically, been used to order plants like, say, a soon-to-be-retired coal plant to remain open. But that didn't end up being legally viable either. It doesn't make sense to use the Defense Production Act to prop up the coal industry. To me, this seems like an administration that is looking for any tool in the policy toolbox. President Trump didn't win by appealing to a massive, previously untapped ex-coal worker constituency. Remember, there are only about 50,000 coal jobs in America. Candidate Trump won, in large part, because he told a very specific story about America that cast the coal miner as its hero. So just as it was during the campaign, being seen as sticking up for coal workers today might be more important politically than actually saving the industry. It's quite humbling to know that despite all of your aspirations, all of your dreams and all the talents you think you have, um, you're made of clay. As the stoic Epictetus used to say, you're nothing but a piece of crockery and a quart of blood.
Every time I go to Paris, I fall in love again with Paris. I also have this great poster from an even greater film, uh, La Femme du Boulanger. Zola, Racine, Balzac, Flaubert. Les soleils mouillés de ce ciel brouillé, pour mon esprit on les charme. This is the history of fromage. Pretty rare bottle of wine. Almost a century old. I'm John Noel Friedman, and this is Clovis. Uh, Clovis is named after the French first king. For the last 25 years, France.com belonged to this guy, a French immigrant living in Miami. But on March 12th, France, the country, took it, claiming the domain is rightfully theirs. Liberté, égalité, my ass. <laughs> now Friedman is suing to get back the website he founded from the country he thought he knew. I'm like in, in a relationship where I'm the spurned uh, uh, lover. Some, someone cheated on me big time. And the question is, will it ever be the same for me? And that I don't know. My idea was to create a, a hub for the Francophile and Francophone community living in the US. For many years, it provided the money for the whole family. Ever since about 2000, we started selling travel products. We sent tens of millions of dollars of, of business to France over the years. The government of France seized France.com by having their own court send an order to the US-based website registrar, web.com. After receiving the order, web.com transferred ownership of France.com to the French government. In a nutshell, their argument is that because we own the name France, we should also own the domain name, France.com, regardless of where in the world is registered. And that tees up some really complicated questions of who governs the internet, right? Whose law is supreme? But France isn't even using France.com. It just redirects to France.fr. So under the relevant American law, um, the government of France has suddenly become a cyber squatter. There are numerous precedents here in the United States that show that France.com is very likely to win its case here, right? That the law is very much on our side and against theirs. The great French tale of revenge, Le Comte de Monte Cristo. If France does win, it could set a precedent, meaning that Lincoln, Nebraska could swoop in and take Lincoln.com, or even that Butzman, Turkey could take Batman.com. So when we started uh, France.com, we did it in full conjunction with the French government tourist office. We did it together. They, they knew from the very beginning, this shows how bullshit, and excuse my French, this whole thing is, because this is an award given by uh, Atout France for best website. The year after, uh, we got a, two awards from the same uh, Atout France, the same uh, people who claimed that we were not authorized to use the name France.com. Neither Atout France, the French Tourism Office, nor the French Foreign Ministry would comment. Web.com would neither. I, I'm struggling, really, to combine uh, what's happened to me with what I thought France was. So, yes, I'm torn, uh, but I know I have to fight to just not let this poison the way I, I see France.